This is the next in our series of thought leader interviews. This special series of interviews is designed to help prepare college leaders for a future visiting activity taking place in summer 2021. We are adding all of these interviews where the participants have allowed it so that our entire college community can listen. In this episode, Teresa Lovers, Commissioner for Higher Education for the State of Indiana, shares her thoughts on the future of education, specifically higher ed in Indiana. I love every time I get to talk with Commissioner Lovers, I learn something in every single interaction we have. This discussion was certainly no exception to that rule. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this episode. Let's listen in. So would you introduce yourself, please, and tell us a little bit about your organization and your role? Teresa Lovers. I'm the Indiana Commissioner for Higher Education. I've been in this role. This is my almost my 12th year. I'm actually, I'm called a SHEO, a State Higher Education Executive Officer, and every state has one. The Commission for Higher Education was created by state statute actually 50 years ago. This year, we celebrate our 50th anniversary. We're a coordinating board. So as the name sort of sounds, we coordinate a system of higher education Uh, The cliff notes might be we do the things that no one institution could do because it requires policies and uh, discussions that cross colleges and universities. And we have very specific charges that we have. We can talk about if you want to. The one that we just finished was, of course, making the recommendations for funding for our public institutions. And then very significant part of our job is to distribute financial aid. We distribute about $390 million a year in financial aid to students. Very good. And what are the primary programs? I think it's a good, it's never a bad thing to remind folks of the programs that are available to Hoosiers. What are the primary programs that you administer? Specifically for financial aid, uh, we have a program that's called the Franco, it's Franco Bannon is the name of it. And under that is, is a higher education award, which is funding that goes to public institutions. And there's a freedom of choice award funding that goes to private institutions. Of course, our big program that we like to tout all the time is the 21st Century Scholars Program. It's uh, We celebrated our 30th anniversary of that program last year. It's our early promise program. Students sign up in seventh or eighth grade. And then in addition to being able to receive scholarship, a, a full scholarship to uh, college or university when you're finished. And we also use those years to make sure that they're more academically prepared for college as well. Our scholars, I know I talk about this all the time because our scholars are the one low gen- low income, first generation minority population that's on target to close the achievement gap. If you fit into any of those categories and you're not a scholar, we are not making the same progress with you. So for multiple reasons, we talk about the scholars program. We also have programs that are designed around specific needs. So we have programs, that, money that we distribute to veterans. We have programs that are aligned to teacher preparation programs trying to recruit more diversity into the teaching force. So lots of programs. We actually rank first in the Midwest and fourth in the nation in the distribution of financial aid. Excellent. And I will link to both the completion report and um, to the 21st Century Scholars Report in our show notes for folks who might want to learn more about those programs. The other program, uh, Kara, that I should, of course, mention is the Workforce Ready Grant because Mm -hmm. Ivy Tech is such an important Mm -hmm. player in this as well. So in addition to telling young people that if if you work hard, we'll make sure you can afford to go to college. We also have a program that says to adults, if you need to be reskilled or you need to look for new opportunities, we we pay for over 150 high value certificates. And uh, we've measured this by both the need and the wage. And we now have about 22,000 Uh, adults who have completed a workforce ready grant. We have about 44,000 that are in the process of completing that. And Ivy Tech has been a key player in this area. You know, one marker of success is that the annual median wage gain for someone who completes one of those high value certificates is $6,800. Absolutely. And we actually hope to do an episode about that um, in the not too distant future. Stacey Townsley and I have been talking about that. So I hope that we get to do that. So, Teresa, as you think about your role and and being at the commission, I'd love to know the big problems that you're trying to solve. Well, our big goal, uh, since you use the word big, is that we have a a goal that 60 percent of Hoosiers would have a quality credential beyond high school by 2025. Uh, We're at 48.3 percent right now. We've made progress but we still have a long way to go. And it's important to know that that number has been selected because that is the the way that we are going to actually meet our workforce needs. And that's a 2025 goal. So it's not gonna stop there. It's gonna keep going after that. And we know that more than ever, economic mobility is tied to educational attainment. 
it's important for me to stop for a moment and say that when I'm talking about this, we're talking about industry certifications, certificates, associate degrees, and beyond. Credentials that align with the needs of the workforce. And so that's our big goal. Our challenges to get there, of course, are right now, it is a problem to, in terms of really convincing Hoosiers of the value proposition of higher education. Uh, we've actually seen a reduction in the college going rate in Indiana over six percentage points in the last five years. We now dropped below 60% with 59%. Again, this includes certificates, so it's not, it's certificates as well as degrees. And so there's a disconnect here between what we know that, that individuals are going to need for economic mobility, what employers need, and how that message is being heard. A recent study showed that more Hoosiers believe that a high school diploma is sufficient for economic mobility than most of the country. At a, now, it's also important to say the majority of Hoosiers don't think that, but 25% of Hoosiers think that compared to 18% of the Midwest and 17% at a national level. And I think that it's not totally to be unexpected because we have a narrative that still is attached to the second half of the 20th century, where if you worked hard and you you had, you know, and you worked in a place where you had health care and benefits and could take care of your family, you know, you, st you still may have that narrative going in your mind. But the world has changed and we have an obligation to make sure that we're coming alongside Hoosiers to convince them. So I think, you know, it is. The big goal, it is the, the economic needs of the state. It's meeting the needs of employers who, who can't find people who have the right skills that they need. And that's going to make it more difficult to recruit companies and keep companies here. Issues related to affordability. People think they're not going to be able to afford higher education. And of course, uh, we know that there are options. And we know that at the community college, between the state aid and Pell dollars, you can afford higher education there. But we need to make sure people understand that. And I think the last thing I would say is we need to make sure that higher education, that people perceive it as being relevant, that what they're learning is relevant to what they want to do. So this earning, you know, learning and earning and, the, and blurring the lines between the two, I think will be more important than ever to convince people that it's worth their time and their money to invest in, in higher education. I want to ask you 47 questions about that answer, but I, ha I have to go on and respect your time. So some other time I'll ask you some more questions about that. What's an interesting trend that you've discovered with your stakeholders that you think will change the way that we work in the future? There are several. I would say the changing demographics of our population. Uh, we have more students who have financial need. We have a, a more diverse population. And so I think adjusting our educational offerings in a more um, individualized, specific way to the students who, who may need extra student supports to get there and be successful in college. So I think the demographic shift is big. I think that other huge change, of course, is the, the movement toward more technology, digital competency, automation, AI. It's changing jobs and it's changing the way we educate people for those jobs. So I think, you know, that's critically important. I think, you know, studies have shown that Indiana is the state most vulnerable to automation and AI. And it's because of the nature of our jobs, especially in advanced manufacturing. So we have to make sure that we're keeping pace with that, which is why a lot of these high value certificates are so important to actually make sure that people are, are getting trained for those. So I think, you know, Technology, automation, AI, demographic shifts, more, more issues related to student support needs that are there. I think all of those are trends that we have to watch. I think that, you know, the most recent trend, of course, and one that's been experienced at community colleges across the country is the enrollment declines. And this was, as you know better than I do, this is contrary to what happened in 2008 and 9 when we saw the biggest increase in enrollment at Ivy Tech that we had seen. And, you know, there are lots of reasons, again, you know them better than I do, but the, the challenges that people had during this time, taking care of families, moms who were trying to work, take care of families, go to school, you know, losing jobs and, the, and their, the lack of confidence, you know, the disconnect, all of these things, I think, have contributed. So I think, you know, dealing with these enrollment flips, I think is going to be really important. And it goes back to making the value proposition that it's worth your time to actually in, invest in higher education. Uh, but, in, you know, not, if you look across the landscape of higher education, not all institutions are going to make it. I mean, there will be some that don't. And so I think it really does require differentiating your mission 
and making it clear about the value proposition that you offer to individuals. I really love that point as we think about the next question, because you hit on something I've been thinking about a lot. What do you think your and our industry will look like post-COVID, whether it's a year, five years, or even 10 years from now? I don't think there's any doubt that technology has shifted this, you know, whether or not, I mean, I think for those residential campuses, of course, that's not the situation for Ivy Tech, but for those residential campuses, I think there will, the students want to return. They want that experience if they can have it, especially you're talking to 18 to 22 year old. But even those campuses, I think you're going to see, uh, you know, more a, a focus on some sort of hybrid kind of learning in some situations. I think that back to the demographic shifts, as you have more adults who need to engage uh, in higher education, I think that uh, looking at the delivery system through uh, technology and how we're going to do that is going to become more uh, become more prevalent in higher education. I think some of it, the story is still yet to be written. You know, I don't think we know exactly what patterns people are going to follow. Where there's no template for this to say. of people are going to go back to doing things the way they did. I think that's probably not likely. Are we, but I do think that we have, we've learned that this, that technology can be an effective way to learn and that it it may be a better way for some people who need the flexibility in their lives. We need to make sure that when we're doing this, we don't sacrifice academic quality. And I think that even if we're doing this sort of this way, I think finding ways to have cohorts of learning around shared goals, I think is going to be important. So people still feel connection, even if they're getting their education in a different way. So we have a lot to learn still, and there'll be a lot of postmortems on on the last year and a half. And from that, I hope we come out better and stronger, but uh, there will be vulnerabilities exposed as well. I look forward to getting to the point where we're actually doing the postmortem. Right. <laughs> we're not quite there yet, but almost. Yes. We're getting close. We are. Let's look a little more, a little broader now. So how do you think the future of work beyond just our industry is going to change over the next five to 10 years? Well, I think my earlier comments about automation and AI actually play out here more than anything else. I think population shifts in states are going to make a difference. Who's going to gain population? Who's going to lose population? You know, good news with the last census is Indiana actually did gain about 4.7%, I think was the population gain that we've seen. So I think, you know, having encouraging people to move to your states, getting people to stay in your states, I think will be an important part. I think, you know, this alignment between employers and educators and community leaders and, and policymakers, I think will become even more important. You know, the days of the academy being here and employers being here and policymakers being here are over. We all have to be attentive to all of those audiences now. But I think the big game changer is technology. My last question, and I think coming from you, this is probably maybe one of the most important voices we need to look at for this question. But what do you think higher education and specifically Ivy Tech should be doing to prepare for the future? Well, I think you're already doing it very much, which is really being responsive to the needs of the students. And instead of the students show up and and we then impart knowledge to them, there are so many other ways in which we have to reach out to students and individualize our messages so that they believe that higher education is for them. Access is going to continue to be important. You know, completion is going to continue to be important. Alignment about what they are learning and how that helps them to get a better job is going to be important. I think that's especially unique offering for Ivy Tech where there is a more seamless relationship between, I think, the the educator community and the employer community as well. I think this whole focus on internships, work-based learning, apprenticeships, I think will be more important than ever. One of the metrics we have in our, at the commission in terms of our strategic plan is that 100% of degrees and programs would have some sort of embedded career relevance, an internship, an apprenticeship, work-based learning, a research project, something that makes sure that you don't finish your program of study and then all of a sudden discover what the job was going to be like. Right. Uh, This doesn't mean people aren't going to change their minds throughout their educational journey. We know that that is the case, but especially I think for a population like Ivy Tech, which serves not only graduating high school students, but, you know, a significant number of returning adults, they have a strong sense that they're investing their time in this to get a good job, to get a better job. 
And so I think to the degree that, you know, Ivy Tech doubles down on that and in those areas of internships, I think will be really important as well. Very good. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. I appreciate you asking and look forward to doing it again sometime. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Our College, Your Voices. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. You can connect with me on Twitter at KNM Tweets. Our producer is Sarah Ferguson. For this special series of episodes, we want to thank our guest producers, Gretchen Keller and Kristen Moreland. You can reach us by email at ourcollegeyourvoices at ivytech.edu. If you're a member of our Ivy Tech faculty and staff, please join our Microsoft Teams listener community. I send out instructions to our entire college community on how to do that every Thursday. Our website is www.ivytech.edu forward slash podcast. You'll find links to show notes and more on that page. Production assistance for this and every episode provided by Becky Campbell and the Ivy Tech Community College Creative Services team. Our podcast concept is by Matthew Pittman. Theme music and post-production services provided by the incredibly talented Jen Eads at the Brassi Broadcasting Company. We'll talk to you next time on Our College, Your Voices.